As you can see, you get two narratives that are fairly complete. You'd be very hard-pressed to do that with any other book, inside or outside of the Bible. And again, we have two stories that are each written in a very different style, each using their own name for God. The first narrative uses the name Yahweh, while the second uses Elohim. The first writer has seven pairs of clean animals and one pair of unclean. The second has simply one of each kind. The first story has a 40-day flood, the second a 370-day flood. In the first, Noah sends out a dove, in the second, a raven. The second writer is very concerned about ages and dates and measurements, while the first writer shows no such concern for details like that. Most scholars think there were at least four writers of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, also called the Pentateuch, or the books of Moses, whose works were later combined and interwoven. These are commonly known as the J, E, P, and D authors. The J stands for Yahweh. Uh, it was originally discovered by uh, Julius Wilhausen, and he wrote in German where Yahweh is written with a J, so it's become known as the J writer. E is for Elohim, P stands for priestly, and D is for a Deuteronomist. The J writer used the term Yahweh for God almost exclusively. The E writer nearly always referred to God as Elohim. The P writer was very likely a priest who was concerned mostly with rules and regulations in his writings, and this was the writer of the second flood story. And the Deuteronomist wrote just about all of Deuteronomy only. Now, of course, some scholars think there were more than uh, these four writers, and they split them up into more categories, and some combined them to have less. But as I said earlier, almost every scholar believes in some form of the documentary hypothesis. If we ask ourselves why anyone would bother to merge together separate stories about the same events to make one compilation story, there's one quick answer which will become apparent. The Jewish nation had a civil war, which lasted about 200 years, shortly after the death of Solomon. During this time, you had a divided nation with Judah in the south and Israel in the north. Most scholars believe that each had their own version of the Torah, and these were quite possibly simply oral versions. But why these versions differed slightly is quite possibly because of the attitudes and dislike the two kingdoms had for one another. They were at war. We can plainly see that the J writer came from Judah and the E writer from Israel because the J stories are nearly always concerned with Israel and the E stories are concerned with Judah. When we untangle the various stories, we can see that the two writers are often trying to place one another in a kind of a bad light. For And here's an example. Both the J and E writers each tell of a story of how the Israelites acquired the city of Shechem. Now Jeroboam would then make Shechem the capital of Israel, remembering Israel's in the north. Now we should remember that the J writer is from Judah. In his version of the story, it says that the prince of the city fell in love with Jacob's daughter Dinah and sleeps with her. He then asked for her hand in marriage. Jacob's sons, however, replied that they could never approve of such a thing because the prince and the other men of the city are not circumcised. So the prince has himself circumcised, and all the men of the city. And while they are still sore and recuperating from this minor surgery, two of Jacob's sons charge into the city and kill them all. So the Israelites acquired the city by way of flat-out treachery. Now keeping in mind that the E-Rider is from Israel in the north, where this city is the capital, his version of the story is simply that Jacob buys the land. So when we separate the various E and J stories, we find this type of sniping at one another's nation more often than not. This is usually done, though, uh, by taking pot shots at various leaders from each other's nations. We also find certain discrepancies within the separate J, E, P, and D stories. These are sometimes as simple as differences in numbers and years, but this sometimes can be important. For instance, according to Genesis 11.26, Abraham was born when his father Terah was 70 years old. Genesis 12.1 says that Abraham is told to leave by God after the death of his father. Now, according to Genesis 11.32, Terah died at the age of 205. This would have made Abraham 135 years old when he left. However, it says in Genesis 12.4 that Abraham was 75 when he left. Obviously, there's a discrepancy here. When we realize, however, that there are two or more points of view being expressed and merged together, we begin to realize why the text is so convoluted in places like this. Imagine if someone had taken the four Gospels and tried to merge them together into one version. 
If that editor was trying to show respect for all the versions, then he might well try to keep all their points of view intact. This would make for discrepancies, though. And, of course, there are several disagreements within the Gospels. One of the more obvious ones is the account of the men appearing at the tomb of the risen Savior. When the women arrive at the tomb, Mark says they see one man. Luke says they see two. Matthew says they see a single angel. John says nothing of them seeing anyone initially. But after the women leave to tell the disciples what they've seen, and Peter and John come and look for themselves, and then they leave, then it says Mary went back to the tomb alone and saw two angels. Obviously, we would have a very convoluted account of the empty tomb episode if we tried to combine them. And this is exactly the kind of thing we see in the Old Testament, particularly in the first five books, over and over. But the difference is that the Old Testament writers are so often taking pot shots at each other's versions of the stories. Both the P and E writers are mostly associated with the southern kingdom of Judah. Jeremiah, who is from the northern kingdom of Israel during the Civil War, sometimes can be seen lashing out at the P writer. The P writer said in Leviticus, for instance, This is the Torah of offering, grain offering, sin offering, trespass offering, installation offering, sacrifice and peace offerings, which Yahweh commanded Moses in Mount Sinai, in the day after he commanded the Israelites to offer their sacrifices to Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai. Then during the Jewish civil war, Jeremiah says, For I did not speak with your fathers, and I did not command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt about matters of offering and sacrifice. So he lashes out against the pea rider, and he does this often enough that he shows that he knows exactly which parts of the Torah were written by the pea rider. And that is very significant to the documentary hypothesis. Now, eventually, the northern kingdom of Israel was defeated by an outside kingdom, and undoubtedly, uh, people in the northern kingdom fled to the south, to Judah, to their, you know, more or less uh, sister kingdom, even though they were feuding like the Hatfields and McCoys, they were, you know, still, they, they were their kin. And so, they more or less merged back together, we might say, uh, the ones that weren't killed or taken captive, merged back together with, with the south. Now, it was just just Judah. There was no more Israel, basically. So now we have two uh, kingdoms living together again, um, each with their own versions of the Torah, after having been apart for 200 years. And we have to ask ourselves exactly what was the impetus that would make anyone bother to take those various religious writings from both kingdoms and try to merge them. Well, theologian Joseph Blankensop came up with a really interesting idea pertaining to this. The Jews during the Babylonian diaspora suddenly found themselves under Iranian rule when the Persians defeated the Babylonians. One aspect of the imperial policy was the insistence on local self-definition inscribed primarily in a codified and standardized corpus of traditional law. And this would be backed by the central government. So Blankensop suggested that this redaction, this merging together of the two uh, various writings from the Jews that had all their laws in it, uh, served a political purpose for the Persians. Uh, they were required to have a standardized corpus of traditional law, and having two or more versions of their history and their laws is not very standardized. So it seems to me Blankensop is probably really on to something with this, that we have here a real impetus for merging together the two various Torahs and whatever else they had written. And like we say, it might have been oral traditions that they had too at the time. 